Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our second uh, online lecture of the semester. I hope you are doing well and being safe out there. Um, before we get into today's material, I want to remind everyone that we're having our second exam uh, this Friday. Well, it will take place over the weekend. <clears throat> Excuse me. So your homework uh, between now and then is to study for exam two. Uh, this will be on chapters four through six, except for we did not cover uh, section 6.6. .6. You don't have to worry about that section on artificial life. Uh, in order to give you guys some flexibility, I'm going to make the exam available on Canvas from uh, Friday. Uh, that's this Friday at 10 a.m. until Sunday at 11.59. So during that uh, almost three-day window, you can log on anytime and take the exam. Um, but just like that quiz we had, you'll have a time limit. Uh, you'll only have 50 minutes to take the exam. I will be posting a... Uh, study guide online, just like I did last time, and this Wednesday's lecture will be uh, a review lecture. So I will uh, review uh, chapters four through six on Wednesday for you guys. All right. Um, I guess we will move on with today's material. So here's a writing prompt for you. Uh, I want you to go ahead and think about this uh, besides Earth, which bodies in the solar system may currently have life? And I want you to explain your answer. So go ahead and push pause and take three minutes to write down your answer. All right, now that you've gotten something written down, I'll go over what I think is a good answer for this question. So... My answer would be that Venus and Mars are the only bodies in the inner solar solar system that are likely to currently have life. Now, why is this? This is because they may both contain liquid water. Remember, we talked about how important it is for life to have liquid water for a variety of reasons. Now, we think in the case of Venus, that water may be high in the atmosphere as little droplets. So Venus might have liquid water droplets high in the atmosphere. And in the case of Mars, Mars um, likely, there's very good evidence for this, has subsurface liquid water. And by subsurface, I mean it's below the soil. Uh, we're thinking of a wet, damp soil. All right. So moving on, looking at some of the other bodies in the solar system, starting our tour here, we have the moon. So um, this picture here to the right is the uh, north pole of the moon. And what it's trying to show you is a bunch of uh, places where uh, water has been identified. The little green circles here, uh, you can see them 
here, here, here. I guess you guys can't see my pen marks, but there's little green circles on that images. All of those craters, uh, water, ice has been identified. So it looks like the moon has large amount of frozen water. And it's mostly in craters and in the polar regions. We think that this water may have been delivered by comets, um, impactors hitting the moon, and then some of that water ends up in these craters, and especially the ones in the polar regions are always in shadow. And so there's just no sunlight um, in those craters to melt what little water ice is there. And so even though there's a large amount of frozen water, there's no liquid water here. So Mercury, here's another picture off to the right here. This is Mercury, and you can see that it also looks very much like the moon with lots of craters. And again, we think that there are, there is water ice in these craters. So you can see um, that these blue craters, these are actually uh, not looking at water, but temperature, showing that the temperature remains low inside those craters, uh, just like I mentioned with the moon, where there's always in shadows, and so the temperatures stay low enough for water ice to exist. So we do see some deposits of frozen water here in craters, but again, no liquid water. Um, part of this, uh, or at least another thing that would make mercury inhospitable is that the temperature swings by about 600 degrees from day to night. Uh, this is because of the lack of atmosphere. So we have these huge temperature changes, even if there is a little bit of life there, probably very inhospitable to it. We can move on to Venus and Mars. Venus here, what you're seeing in this picture, this is Venus with CO2 clouds. So the clouds are carbon dioxide, uh, maybe some water um, up there in the higher part of the atmosphere. So part of the problem with Venus here is that the CO2 clouds um, cause it to have a runaway greenhouse effect here. And so the surface temperature of Venus is roughly 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that's hot enough to melt lead. So it is way too hot for liquid water at the surface. Now, just like Earth's atmosphere, it gets cooler and cooler and cooler as you go higher in the atmosphere. And so um, there may be parts high up in the atmosphere where it's cool enough for uh, water droplets to exist. Uh, another problem with Venus is because of this uh, very dense carbon dioxide atmosphere, uh, the pressure at the surface is about 10 times greater than Earth. So the atmospheric pressure is very intense. Um, this also makes it very inhospitable. Uh, not to mention that it uh, rains sulfuric acid out of the clouds. So um, again, even though the surface is very inhospitable, the takeaway here is that there may be water droplets high in the clouds. Okay, the last planet here in the inner solar system, other than Earth, obviously, uh, is Mars. 
Now, Mars is a, a different story here. At Mars, there's extensive evidence for abundant liquid water in the past. So we see rivers, valleys, gully networks, uh, lots and lots of liquid water. We see terrain that looks like it may have water oozing out of it today on the surface. So hillsides that look like they become damp when the sun hits them, uh, things like that. Uh, so we're thinking that there's good evidence for subsurface liquid water. We also see lots and lots of subsurface ice. In many places, if you scrape away the top few uh, centimeters of soil, uh, it looks ice, icy underneath. Um, so there's a really good chance that because of Mar Mars's wet history and um, perhaps evidence for liquid water today, that there's a really good chance of life on Mars. All right, moving on. So, moving to the outer solar system, where's the most likely place to find life in the outer solar system? So remember, this is Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and the Kuiper Belt. So go ahead and pick hit pause and think about this question for a moment. All right, it turns out that the correct answer here is B, the large icy moons of Jupiter and Saturn. And this is because these are likely to have a very large subsurface oceans. If we look at some of these other planets, uh, or rather the, the planets of the outer solar system, uh, these are unlikely to have life, um, mostly because they are mostly made of hydrogen and helium, um, and there may be no solid surface at the center. These pictures down here show a core of rock and metal. Uh, whether or not that's solid, we really don't know. Uh, we've never been able to send any spacecraft down there. We can't see the interiors. And um, our physical models for how material behaves at those temperatures and pressures uh, is very poorly understood. So uh, now the outer regions here, as you can see up here, are very, very cold. Down here is uh, looking at like minus 100 uh, Celsius. So very, very cold and cold enough for ammonia to form clouds. Now it does heat up as we go deeper and deeper into the atmosphere. Uh, once we get down here, an altitude of around 100 kilometers from the top, we can see that it is warm enough for water to start condensing or cool enough depending on how you say it as we go deeper and deeper and deeper into the atmosphere it gets hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter um, due to compressional heating so it's very cold um, in the surface layers of the atmosphere but very hot in the center due to heating. And part of the reason it's so cold out there is just because, remember, we're getting very, very far from the sun. We talked about last time how the sun's energy gets more and more and more diluted as we get farther away. And so by the time we get to the outer solar system here, there's very, very little heating from the sun. Um, now, even though there is some water up here in the atmosphere, um, there are very strong vertical winds 
in this atmosphere. And so stuff is being pushed to the top and then driven back down, and this cycle repeats over and over again. We call these convection currents, just like in a pot of boiling water where the water rises to the top and sinks to the bottom of the pot again, over and over again. And so these strong convection currents... Um, they make it, uh, so the air goes through very different temperatures, uh, hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold. Uh, that's not very hospitable to life. So these make life in the atmosphere very unlikely. It's just not very hospitable. Now, Uranus and Neptune um, are colder, um, but they, again, sort of have the very similar thing going on. Very, very cold, uh, maybe some water at some point, uh, at some level in their atmosphere, but also strong vertical winds. Uh, there's enough similarities between all of these four planets uh, that we just think there's not going to be any life uh, possible in their atmospheres. Now, the large moons and dwarf planets are another story. This moon here is Europa. This is uh, one of the larger moons of Jupiter. And down here, we can see a very nice picture of Pluto. You can see a lot of what we call uh, ice geology here. So it's a little bit like rock geology where you can get... Um, Tectonic features like cracks, you can see those here on Europa, the different, we think this is the ice bending and cracking. You can see this orange colors, uh, these orange colors and the ice cracks, we think that may be stuff bubbling up from the subsurface ocean. Uh, here we don't see any cracks on Pluto, but there are large regions here that have been resurfaced. We know that because there's no craters. We talked about that a while ago. Now this may be simply a result of impact. But again, Pluto is covered uh, in a layer of water ice. So both of these types of bodies, both the moons of the giant planets and these Kuiper belt objects like Pluto, they all contain large amounts of water ice. Their surface is probably a few kilometers thick of ice. And so we get low energy ice geology. That's what we talked about with the cracks and the resurfacing. And we say low energy because it takes a lot less energy to do these things with ice than it does with rock. Um, now, even though these both have um, lots of ice, we think that on the Kuiper belt objects, there is probably no liquid water underneath. Now, the icy moons, in contrast, probably have um, very large oceans, maybe a kilometer thick. So the icy moons almost certainly have subsurface oceans. And now this is due to, is primarily due to tidal heating. Heating, this is tidal Oops, I spelled that wrong. Tidal interactions with their respective planets and or other moons in the system. So by tidal heating, as the moons go around the planets, as they interact with one another, uh, gravity bends and stretches these objects. It pulls on the different sides of them, different amounts, and this repeated bending and pulling of the planet um, would heat it up. Just like if you take a piece of metal and bend it a bunch of times, uh, you can feel how it gets warm there where it's been bending. 
so this is called tidal heating. This is the reason we don't think that Pluto and the Kuiper Belt objects, we think that um, these things don't have uh, liquid oceans, um, some from observations, but mostly because there's no source of heating for these things. Where Europa, these moons, they're in systems around giant planets, there's multiple moons there, and so these things are all interacting with each other through gravity. Because of these large oceans, these moons are a good place to look for life. And the moons we're talking about here primarily for Jupiter, we have Europa, that's the one shown in the picture, one called Ganymede, and um, perhaps Callisto. Uh, in the Saturn system, we are thinking primarily of Titan, but also a smaller moon called Enceladus. Now, these moons are relatively small compared to the planets that they're around, but they're not really small compared to some of the terrestrial planets. It turns out this moon Ganymede of Jupiter is actually larger than the planet Mercury. So these things are like mini solar systems in their own right, and maybe not a surprising place to find life. The big problem here is that, again, we're very far from the sun, so there's no solar energy. And so if there is any life there, it would almost certainly have to get its energy from uh, chemical sources, these uh, chemoautotrophs. All right. And I guess that's the last slide we have for today. So remember to study for the exam. All right. And that's it for today. Um, take care and be safe out there.